Thank you. Can you hear me? Oh, I need the... So I got involved with cryptocurrency uh, about 2017. And I heard all these statements. It's a bubble. It's a fraud. And I figured uh, if I had a Bitcoin for every time I heard a comment like that, I would be a very wealthy person right now. But I was really interested in facts. I'm an engineer, so I don't want to judge things on emotions. Should I invest in Bitcoin? What the hell does that even mean? Because it's different. Are there business opportunities? John said, I'm an entrepreneur, and indeed, I'm, I'm always looking for how can we take advantage of something? And then what else is coming? So first of all, here's my disclaimer. I do not give financial advice. This is not a recommendation to buy or sell or do anything. Um, there's a little bit about my background. You'll notice my email address is in the bottom, and I have an offer for everyone at the end. I wrote a book a while back. If you want a PDF copy of the book, just send me an email, and I'll, I'll send it to you. So does everyone know what fiat currency means? Fiat currency is a currency that is valuable because the government says it is. Right? Here's a fiat currency, and it's valuable because the government declares by fiat it is valuable. Here's another one. I have a $100 trillion bill in my wallet. A buddy of mine used to use them for business cards. The real story. Why did the uh, Zimbabwe Federal Reserve Bank print a hundred trillion dollar bill. When they did the hundred billion dollar bill, they didn't have enough money. So clearly all they needed was three more zeros. That bill right now is worth a couple bucks. So what's the difference between a good fiat currency and a bad fiat currency? Trust, right? Do you trust the country that's backing it? I do not trust the Bank of Zimbabwe, right? So today, money is digital. If you think your dollar bills are real currency, try everyone going to the bank this afternoon and take all your money out in cash. There isn't enough cash, nowhere close. It is centralized. It's controlled by the Federal Reserve in this country. Other countries have their own central bank. It is inflationary by design. The Federal Reserve is happy to have 2% inflation rate every year. We're a little above that right now. And we have all agreed, whether you want to admit it or not, we have all agreed that a piece of paper represents value. You have some bills in that. We all agree that that represents value. It's just paper. Does anyone know when we got off the gold reserve? 1971. Was it the 1930s when it started? And Nixon finished it in the 70s. We haven't been on the gold reserve for almost 100 years. So the U.S. dollar has not been backed by gold for a long time. Inflation tax, you know, now we have words like quantitative easing and stimulus packages, but when the Federal Reserve just issues money, we're going to have inflation. So regardless of what inflation is going on right now, our Federal Reserve has managed the U.S. dollar over the last 30 years to be worth half what it was 30 years ago. That's a sobering thought. So now I'm going to talk a little bit about Bitcoin. 
There's a number of characteristics that we could go into. I do a seminar that's about two hours long, so I can't get into all of it. John asked me to explain Bitcoin in 15 minutes, and I said, no. <laughs> um, but I want to point out a couple of things. First of all, it's decentralized. There is no government that controls it. There is no central bank. That's really important to grasp. So you can hear on the news that the government of China is going to clamp down on Bitcoin. Okay? They're not in charge of it, so it doesn't really matter. I heard this morning the IRS is going to, you have to file with the IRS any transaction valued over $10,000. Okay, what if I don't? Right now the banks report all that information back to the IRS. <laughs> But what if there was no bank? So they can put all kinds of regulations in. It doesn't mean any of them are going to be followed. And one of the most important points, the supply of Bitcoin is limited. There will never be more than 21 million Bitcoin in circulation. Currently, there's about 19 million Bitcoin in circulation. And that will stop the extra two million will be issued over the next hundred years. Miners, and I'll talk about that in just a moment. So has everyone heard about the blockchain? Have you heard the term? I got some yeses, some noes. Blockchain is just a database. It's an open database. Everyone can see what's on the ledger. Everyone can see what's in the database. What makes it interesting is that it cannot be modified by anyone, by any hacker. This is probably the most secure piece of software that we have on the planet. The blockchain has never been hacked. You'll hear of hacks and exchanges and other ways that people might lose their cryptocurrency, but the blockchain has never been compromised. So this is my segue into a little bit of uh, cryptography. Bear with me a moment. So this is the engineer in me. So what makes this so secure? You see in that gray box, I have a couple of transactions that I want to record on the, on the Bitcoin blockchain. And then that arrow points to a piece of dummy data called a nonce. And the goal of the miners, who I just told you about a moment ago, the miners have to figure out what nonce should I put in there so that a hash, this is a hash of that data, I want that hash to start with 16 zeros or whatever the number is. So I have to modify that nonce. You see, there's a capital P and then I change it to a lower P. And if you notice that hash changes significantly. So you can't guess what the nonce would be. You have to actually go through the exercise, guess, 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 until you get the right hash. And you keep going along, and here I have an example, maybe it's all lowercase x's. And you see that hash comes out with a bunch of leading zeros. That block is now validated, and it kind of gets reserved. So, let's see if I have my pointer working. So you see, that's the block we were just talking about, the hash with a bunch of zeros, and then that hash goes to the next block. If I had one mining rig trying to validate that block, and I was the only one validating, it might take me about two years for that computer running 724 to come up with the right nonce to validate that block. It takes a lot of computing power. These blocks get updated roughly every 10 minutes. So there's so many computers worldwide all working on this, one of them will solve the problem in 10 minutes. Then you create another block. And these get chained together, thus the clever term blockchain. 
So if I wanted to go back and see where it says um, Abel sends 0.01 BTC to Bob, if I wanted to change that to Abel sends it to John, I have to go in, I have to validate that block, and all the subsequent blocks in the chain before the 10 minutes is up. And it's impossible. Can't be done. So that's my uh, segue into engineering. But it's important to know how much money is in gold. And I believe they have the same utility, but Bitcoin is much easier, much more portable, much easier to divide, much easier to store than gold is. So if we hit six trillion in market cap, the price per Bitcoin will be $315,000. So when my wife said, do we want to sell at 20,000? The answer is no, we're heading to 300,000. I still think that's true. You're going to ask, okay, in what time? I can't answer that. That's, that's the flow of money coming in and people trusting Bitcoin will determine the rate. That's why people say, oh, it's so volatile. That just means more people are coming in. You know, we had a run up to about 64,000 a couple weeks ago. And then everybody, the traders pulled their money out. Okay, so the price trader makes, your account will make as well. I think it's a great service. Um, another term, the DYOR, do your own research. Anytime you see a presentation, people are gonna say, do your own research, because again, I don't give investment advice. <coughs> One of the questions John Knight talked about a couple of weeks ago is Dogecoin, because that was prior to Elon Musk going on to Saturday Night Live, and the price of Dogecoin was taking off. Now with Bitcoin and everything up and down, Dogecoin has kind of gone back into, the, back into the background. I don't like Dogecoin as an investment because I don't understand the use case. It doesn't mean it's a bad coin. It means I don't understand it, so I'm not investing. If you like it, if you know how it's used, go for it. But what I would tell you is any crypto that you get involved with, make sure you know why it's valuable and how it would be used. And if you don't, stay clear of it. Just because Elon Musk promotes it doesn't mean it's a good thing. So my predictions, and this is, this is fun. If you go to YouTube and search, what is internet anyway? you'll get this video clip from 1994. Bryant Gumbel talking about the, what is the, the A with the circle around it? Is, is it at or about? What does that mean? And they're talking about email. And none of the three of them on the couch know anything about it. My guess is we all have email running in our pockets right now with our smartphones. It's part of life. That was 1994. I think we're going through the same kind of disruption with money that we saw with the internet. I can't tell you exactly what it's gonna be, but here's some of my guesses. Governments cannot control Bitcoin. I don't care what they say. They cannot control it. If they wanted to stop cryptocurrencies, they'd have to stop all internet traffic. They can block access points. So your on-ramps, if you will. These are usually exchanges like Coinbase or Kraken. So there's a bunch of development going on right now to decentralized exchanges. So they won't be able to shut those down either. I think governments can and will propose regulations. Some of them might even make sense. 
I know a lot of them won't make any sense. So just because they put a regulation in doesn't mean it's enforceable, doesn't mean anyone's gonna follow it. It could help with tax liabilities. Um, and I fear the United States will not be the most crypto-friendly country. The innovation will come from other countries. Um, several years ago, Dr. Bostic from the Atlanta Federal Reserve was here. And he did, he was over at uh, Meadowview, whichever direction. Um, and he did a lunch and learn. And it was really funny because the room was full of bankers in three-piece suits. And I went walking in, I had shorts on and a red and white check shirt. I stood out like a sore thumb. So I don't care. Um, so after Dr. Bostic was done with his presentation, I said, with all the excitement with cryptocurrencies, do you see the Federal Reserve getting involved? And he went on for about five minutes explaining the evils of Bitcoin and cryptocurrency because it's used for terrorism, money laundering, extortion, all these horrible things. And John being John, I stuck my hand up and said, follow on question, since the US dollar is used for all those activities more than any other currency in the world, do all your comments apply to the US dollar? He didn't answer it. Um, Federal Reserve is now talking about a, issuing their 